because there's value in that. But the value that you're going to receive from the Lord is a value that you get as you share that with other people. Not only just talk about it, but be passionate and alive and engaged with this idea of prayer. Now, let me, let me ask you this. this. This day or last week or whenever it was, during your quiet time, you all have quiet times, right? Yes. Shake your heads. Yes. Yep. If I ever ask John, John, tell me about a cow. I mean, it's immediate. The response is just immediate. And if I ask John Paul about John Williams, it's immediate. Okay. During your last quiet time, what did the Spirit say to you? What scriptures were prompted in your mind? And so this is, this is what I think that our prayer for in the community is, is it's an idea of not only praying, but being alone and abiding with the Lord himself, and then taking that precious time, allowing it to just fill us, and then going and sharing that. It's an amazing thing that happens. Um, I was reading 1 John uh, today, and it's amazing when you just read through the word. And the things that the Spirit speaks to you as you read and as you pray about it, as you engage in it, and that's what prayer is, is engagement in the word. It's, a, it's truly amazing what the Spirit speaks to you. So my experience is that, Lord, I want to spend time and I want to abide with you because I know that that's the only place where we can go and ask but f and knock and seek and that he's honored by that. So my, my uh, testimony is that it's an amazing thing what God will do if his people, and we've quoted this over and over and over again, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. What will happen? And you all know. But that should be shouting at us from our innermost being that God will answer. He does answer. So Greg asked me to um, share a few thoughts and he asked me last week, and then he called me today, because I thought, well, I think he forgot that he would ask me, and that's okay, I'll just listen. <laughs> then today I went, yeah, he did ask me. But I'm usually not short of words once I get started. I think it must be from 40-plus years of teaching. You learn to multiply words, right? But when he said it uh, on prayer, a lot of things came to my mind. And I wanted to read a couple of scriptures and then just share a couple of experiences that sparked me in what Greg's talking about. But these are some scriptures that came to mind. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that we, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Look to God, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. That's 1 Chronicles 16:11. In 2 Chronicles 6.21, he says, Here are the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your, whole, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. If you then, though you are evil, know how, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, my mother was a sparky lady. And, yes, yeah, she was. Little lady, barely five feet if she stretched. But, you know... 
When I was young, I remember my mom would say, you know, if you ask for something from the Lord, and you visualize that, and you are faithful to pray, that will come to pass. When I was eight and nine years old, I wanted a horse really bad. But we lived in a place that wasn't zoned for horses. So um, my mom would say, if you pray for anything, so I thought, OK. That's what my mom said. I got down on my knees every night. I started, I remember, I started when I was nine years old. And I prayed for a horse. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I would ask my dad, nope, we're not getting a horse. It's not zoned for horses here. Nope. And I turned 10. No horse yet. I used to visit the guy down the street, and he, let, he had two horses named Sonny and Prince. And he would let me ride him in his little he had a little run that was about five feet. <laughs> and, I would, I, and I would just think. So then I would um, pray at night, and I thought, my mom told me to visualize, to see that thing coming to pass. So I went. So I would say my prayers, and I would get in bed, and I would visualize myself riding this horse bareback up this lane through a little creek, and the wind blowing in my hair, and the leaves on the trees. And I would, every night, my mom said, if you visualize and you ask the Lord, he would answer it. So when I turned 11, my dad said, I think we're going to get a horse. We're going to keep it down at um, your uncle's down in American Fork. We lived in Salt Lake. And of course, I was ecstatic and just so happy. And we bought this horse. His name was Pat. He was a parade horse. Um, that a guy wrote in the Ute Rangers, and he would ride him deer hunting. He was a bay. He was a big horse. And when we bought him, um, the family was out on the front porch, and they all cried when we bought him. They all cried when he left. His name was Pat, and he was 11 years old, and I was 11 years old. And I always knew how old Pat was because he was my same age. Well, then we bought this other horse um, that I learned how to ride on because she bucked me off every day every day that I wrote her, but and her name was Minnie. But um, the one thing that I, I'll tell you about this prayer was, um, my uncle had this farm, and he had the corrals down by his house, and he had a series of fields, and he had this lane that went up or along his fields, and then in the, in the winter, summertime, he would have the horses. He had a horse, and he called it Pig, because it had no withers. And he's that, his horse was named Pig. <laughs> Our horse was named Pat. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we would have to, we would ride our horses and we'd take the saddles off and put them down in the corral and then we would have to take the horses up to the summer pasture. And we had to ride the horses along this lane that had this creek flowing by it and they had a series of trees that were quaking at those silver-leafed aspens that would shimmer in the breeze. And I was riding up there one night and I went, I have been here before. I've been here before. Every night, I would see myself riding this horse bareback up this little lane with the, tr with the wind blowing in my hair and the, and the breeze shimmering through trees. And I went, I have been here before. It was my first experience where I went, God answers prayers. Now, I thought at that point a little bit that he was the candy man in the sky, and he let me know that he wasn't. So I, everything I prayed for didn't happen that way. But my mom would always talk about that. And, and we took all the widows in the, in the city to church, and my mom had talked to the widows, and Dean and I had been back of the car, and I think a lot of stuff did get in what she talked to the widows about, but they would talk about prayer and things like that. And you know, it made a big um, impression in my life. So I want to tell you one other prayer that I, was answered to me, and then I want to tell you something that I, I think maybe some of you have heard this story before. But God answers prayer. And you know, last year we started praying for God to heal our land, and we need rain. And you know, we prayed for rain, and we got a little bit of rain. And you go, and you go, but it isn't enough. And I'm going, but did I thank God for the rain that we got? Did I thank him? Yes, I did, for every drop. And this year, when I opened the thing, they go, oh, it's another La Nina. Southwest is not getting any rain, and I went, Lord, we will continue to pray. Just like Elijah's servant, or Elisha, or whoever it was that saw the little cloud, I'll still keep praying and visualize that rain. But 
So a second experience, and Johnny's not here, but Johnny would remember this experience. And these experiences sound kind of trivial. You know, she, she was 11 and she got a horse. I prayed for two years for that horse. <laughs> and my dad wasn't going to get one, so we finally did. Um, this second, second experience was kind of interesting, and it, it doesn't sound like much, but it was. Um, you all have maybe heard of who Jerry Owen was. Your young people haven't heard much about him, but people my age and older know who Jerry Owen was. He was an evangelist that came here, and he had a special gift that he remembered every scripture in the Bible, and he would see it, and he would do, preach sermons, and he would just, one would come, and it was phenomenal. But Jerry had a heart that we all know the Lord, and he would come out here and, and want us all to know the Lord. Well, through him, um, when I, I came to here, school here when I was a senior, a junior, and when I was a senior, he came. And through one of his meetings, I really was touched and gave my heart to the Lord. And at that time, um, he came out. He had um, a guy who was in prison, but he was on parole with him. And the guy had to be back, because you know when they're on parole, they keep track of him. He had to be back a certain day. And so he came and gave his little message and then and gave us oranges and candy. And I was really touched, and, and, but he had to leave. And all of us kids were, were sad. We wanted him to stay longer. And so at that point, I was teaching um, Sabbath class to the kids. And Johnny was in my Sabbath class. He was eight. Okay? And I had a, a bunch of kids, and, I, and they all went, we want Jerry Owen to come back. And I said, me too. Let's all pray that he comes back. Then I thought, what am I doing to these little kids? When God said, whatever you pray for, he would come back. So they all, we all prayed. We got in a circle. We prayed. And, um, and then I got done with that, and I went. I told all these little kids that God answered prayer, and they're eight years old. And what if God doesn't answer this prayer? Because he had to go back, and he had to get that prisoner back to California. <laughs> And I thought, what did I do? I went up on Black Mountain, and it was raining that day, I remember. And I went, God, I don't know what I did, but if, you're gonna, if you could possibly answer this prayer for me and these kids so I don't look like a fool and that they don't lose their faith, okay, <laughs> then please do. Well, the rest of the story is this. Jerry and Roberta, his wife, and this, and this guy went over to Ely, and Merle Rawlings lived there at that time. And he was staying with Merle. And they stopped and they stayed overnight at Merle Rawlings' house. And he got up in the morning and they were getting ready to go to California. And he goes, Roberta, we got to go back to Estelle. And she said, you can't go back to Estelle. This guy has to get back to California. He says, I have to go back to Estelle. We have to go back. The Lord's telling me we have to go back. So they came back. <laughs> they came back. They didn't stay very long. He had to get that. But, and then we told him what. But, I mean, that made a huge impression, and if you ask Johnny about it, he will remember that, because that was a huge impression. And so you go, well, that was kind of a, does God answer prayer? It's not rain, but it's that. One other thing, because sometimes as we get older and we get jaded, I'm going, how long do we have to pray for things? I mean, I prayed two years for a horse. The Jerry Owen thing was pretty neat. It was spontaneous, okay? But how long do we have to pray for rain? How long do we have to pray for people in the house of Aaron? How long do I have to pray for my kids who aren't believing right now? How long when I get discouraged? Are you going to answer prayer, God? Um, do you really do miracles? Of course, I look in the Bible, and Abraham was praying a long time for Isaac, <laughs> but that happened. Well, there was one experience I came on, and this is the last one I'll, I'll tell you about. But once in a while, and I, I know some of you will go, Ugh, but as once in a while, I like to hear these near-death experiences, okay? So I'll just kind of Google them and see. And some of you might have read this one. Um, Dr. Chauncey, I can't remember his last name. He said he's a heart surgeon, and, and he's in Florida, and he's still there, Christian. But, um, well, I actually took a picture of this. Don't look it up because you can't. No, no, I have a picture of the thing, so I, I, I knew I couldn't look it up. And I know Greg's worried that I'm taking too long, but um, I just have one more thing. Okay, it's on my picture here. Okay. Um, he was a heart surgeon, Crandall, Chauncey Crandall. 
That's his name. Um, and he, he um, had a guy, he was on call, he was a heart surgeon, and a guy came in to the hospital. He didn't feel very good. The guy, I, the guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, he came into the hospital. He wasn't feeling well, and he collapsed on the floor. He had a cardiac attack went into the emergency room and they tried to revive this man and they couldn't. Um, I'll just read it so I don't um, get the things. There was no life in the man. His face and his feet and his arms were completely black with death. I sat next to his body and I prayed, Lord, Father, how am I going to pray for this man? Well, just, just one thing, they had tried to revive this man for several, for a long time and they couldn't revive him so they pronounced him dead. And this doctor pronounced him dead at 1120. And um, he went out, went, went to go out, and the nurse was getting the body ready, and the, and the feet and everything were going black. And um, the Lord told that doctor to go back in and pray. And he said, I can't do that. That guy is dead. And he was fighting the Lord, but this is what happened. Um, I sat next to his body, and I prayed, Lord, Father, how am I going to pray for this man? He's dead. What can I do? All of a sudden, these words came out of my mouth. Father God, I, pray, I cry out for the soul of this man. If he does not know you as his Lord and Savior, please raise him from the dead right now in Jesus' name. It was an ama amazing as a couple of minutes later, we were looking at the monitor and all of a sudden a heartbeat showed up. It was a perfect beat, a normal beat. And after a couple of more minutes, it start, he started moving and then his fingers were moving and then his toes began moving and he started mumbling the words. There was a nurse in the room and she was not a believer. And she screamed out and said, Dr. Crandall, what have you done to this patient? And I said, all I've done is to cry out for his soul in Jesus' name. We quickly rushed the gentleman down to the intensive care unit, and the hospital was by now buzzing with the fact that a dead man had been brought back to life. After a couple of days, he woke up. He had an amazing story to tell after I asked him, where have you been? And what, where were you on that day that you were, had that massive heart attack? You were gone, and we prayed you back to life in Jesus' name. Speaking to his recovered um, patient after this event, the astonished man said the most amazing thing. I was in a dark room and there was no light. It was complete darkness and I felt I was in a casket and I kept repeating that I was so disappointed. And all of a sudden this man came in and they wrapped me up and they threw me in the trash. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, speaking to this recovered patient after the event, the astonished man said, okay, all right, let's see. Um, okay, the doctor then led the man to, the doctor um, led the man to the Lord. I explained the salvation man to, or message to this man as the man sat in his bed, and I held his hand and I cried out, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray this man accepts you as his Lord and Savior right here in the intensive care unit. He held out his hand and accepted Christ as his Savior with tears rolling down from his eyes, and now he's a child of God. I told him, you, have never, you never have to be thrown in the trash into total darkness now. The life of Christ is in you and the light of the kingdom of heaven is in you now. There's just one last thing you need to know. When Asked Dr. Crandall if there had been any brain damage to the patient. He said, no, there was no brain damage at all. His brain was completely normal. I was most concerned about his hands because his fingers were completely black and he had some numbness in his fingers and his feet. But now that is totally resolved. So through the time Dr. Crandall couldn't give the patient's name, he advised, all I can say that is that he was 53 years old and he was a car mechanic. He had a family that were believers, but he left them 20 years ago because he didn't believe in the Lord. His family continued to pray for 20 years for his salvation, and his ex-wife was on her hands and knees praying for the salvation of her ex-husband who came to know the Lord that day. So 20 years, a few hours for Jerry Owen to come back, two years for my horse. I think that we can pray. I think it's a good thing to pray. Well, you know, part of, part of relating some of those things is there are answers. And just to let you know, and you've probably all heard about it, uh, but I, I probably have the total wrong. But, John, how, how much rain did we get that a month ago, a month and a half ago? Uh, well, 
almost two inches. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And how we got that rain for a lot of different factors, and the Lord blessed us, obviously, but part of it was through prayer. And I think that we need to continue to pray, continue to seek it. I know that it gets, am I doing this all alone? No, we're all doing it. And that's what's important. Um, one of the scriptures that impressed me in the writings is, get yourselves together and taught the commandments one unto another. You'll know the law before the time. That's what we're doing with prayer. Get yourselves together and pray. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal the land. What, what a mighty blessing that would be. We would all look forward to that. But it takes perseverance. It takes endurance. It takes the patience to continue to do it and not give up. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God. And part of the weapons that we have and part of the defensive mechanisms that we have in the spirit is prayer. And I think that that is vital for all of us is that, that degree of prayer. So as the Lord answers prayer for you, be ready to give a witness. Be ready to give a testimony for what God is doing in wonderful ways that he is. So, leave that with you. God bless. Appreciate the uh, insights that Greg and Lois shared. It really goes along with just a few words that I want to mention here. I, we talked about this, we've talked about it several times in fact, that when you talk about scriptural things, you've got to know the information as well as know how to apply it. And you, there's, sometimes there's a tendency to, does this ring? Maybe higher, is that better? Sometimes we want to skip learning the stuff. You know, if, if you go to a dentist and he says, you know, I really didn't like school, but I love dentistry, you might think, I'm going down the street to the other dentist. Or, you know, a doctor that said, I flunked all my exams, but I sure like operating on people. You need to know a little bit about what you're talking about. And I think when it comes to the feast, just a couple of things I say it every year, and I know you get tired of it, but it really irritates me when people tell me they never heard something. And so I make sure you'll hear it every year. There are three major feasts, and in those three major feasts there are seven. There's Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Waving of the Sheaf. There's Shavuot, or Pentecost. And then there's Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, or the Blowing of the Trumpets the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. The interesting thing, or the important thing about these are, they're, they're different than every other holiday we have, in that we choose the other holidays. Even Purim was chosen by the Jews to remember what God did for them. Same with Hanukkah, same with Christmas. And, and Easter is a mix, because Easter is really Passover, but if you say this around Messianics, they get mad, so don't. But uh, it is. But these are God's appointment with us. And so the word for the feast is Chag or Moed. Chag just means to celebrate. It actually comes from a word, Chagag, which did you watch what was going on over here when we were singing tonight? What were these ladies doing? They were dancing, but how were they dancing? Circle dancing. 
The word chagag is specifically circle dancing. And you'll notice, you'll find a lot of ancient cultures, and also the Jewish culture, dancing is in a circle. And so the feasts are times of celebration. Moed just means it's appointed. The time, the place, the season. We talked about all this a lot, and I, th and I think you know it. There's something I want to just bring up tonight. I had never seen there's a relationship between Passover and Sukkot that I had missed. Anybody know what our theme for the feast this year is? Entering the inheritance. Is that right? What does it mean to enter the inheritance? Well, when you look at Israel, the first thing they had to do was leave Egypt. That was Passover. And then they had to receive God's instruction. That was Shavuot. And then to come into their inheritance is a little different thing, and it's weird. What, what's the primary way that God has commanded us to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot? We have to do what? We have to live in booths. When did Israel live in booths after they left Egypt? The first night they left. Now I want you to think about something with me. How many of you in the last year or two or ten years have been through a time of insecurity? Have been through a time of questioning? A time of fear? The children of Israel, when they left Egypt, what were they leaving? Slavery. And they were getting what? Freedom. Yay, right? The first night in the sukkah, there was no roof overhead. They probably had the animals with them. Where was their food coming from tomorrow? The only food they had was bread that hadn't had time to raise. They were eating matzah crackers, sleeping with their sheep. See the stars overhead, and they had this wonderful sense of freedom that was almost completely covered up by fear of the unknown. Because where before they knew where their meals were coming from, they knew they had a roof over their head, they knew they were going to be taken care of. Do you know since the Soviet Union collapsed in December of 91, they've taken a poll every year of the people in the Soviet Union and ask them, are you happy that the Soviet Union fell apart? Except one year when 49% said they weren't happy, every other year over half the people were angry and unhappy that the Soviet Union had collapsed. The Soviet Union had no freedom of the press, no freedom of religion, no freedom of transportation, no freedom of economic endeavor. And yet, why did people hate that to go away? Because there's something in us that will take the security of slavery over the freedom of the unknown. What I want to say to you tonight, at Sukkot, one of the things that we do is we go to the pool of Siloam and we take water every day and we bring it to the altar. Did you know there's a scripture that talks about, the, in Isaiah 8, that the children of Israel rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh for the rivers of Syria. And it said they were more interested in the leader of Syria or the king of Israel, son of Ramalia. And it says, okay, God says, fine, you've rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, which he was speaking of the kingdom of David's inheritance. And he says, all right, I'll let you have the rivers of Syria and Assyria, and they'll destroy you. They'll come and take you out. This is happening to our society today. We have rejected what God has told us to do. And so we're getting the rivers of this culture that we don't want. At Sukkot, we celebrate harvest. What's necessary for harvest? Water. Nutrition. You know what, what Greg and Lois were sharing with us? Prayer. What does prayer do? Prayer is one of the ways that we tend the plant. God plants seeds in our heart. There's hope in every one of you. See, it's like I just saw Kara today for the first time in several weeks. What's Kara doing? She's going to school. 
Why? There's a seed. There's a germ inside of her, and she's taking care of it. She's raising it. She's letting it germinate. She's letting it grow. It's going to become something. There's probably some days she wonders, I don't know if you ever went through this, Kara, but I got into Salt Lake, got ready to go to university. I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't know anybody. I'm terrified. It's all different. I don't want to do this. Can we ever move on in our freedom or going to our inheritance if we live in the fear of the past and stay locked in the past? This God wants you to be everything he created you to be. What happens on the 50th year when the trumpet is blown on the Day of Atonement? It's Jubilee, and everyone does what? They, goes back, they go back to their inheritance. I don't want to take a lot of time tonight, but I want to stimulate in you the hope that the anxiety and the insecurity, the things you face, are God saying, I've taken you, I've set you free by the blood of the Lamb. I've taken you out. Sometimes the first steps of freedom are frightening. But it's worth it. And one of the things that's very important for us, I've been thinking a lot about the water because of the pools of Shiloh, is the water of the word. You know, Isaiah 55 talks about the fact that the word of God is like the water, the rain that falls on the mountains and the snow. And he says it doesn't return void. After the rain falls on the mountain, the snow falls on the mountain, the trees grow, the pines develop. It waters, it fills the streams with water so the deer and the antelope and the mountain lions can drink. It, it's what makes life happen. The dangerous thing for us, and looking at this pool of Siloh, Shiloh, what's interesting is what do we call our valley? Shiloh Valley. You know what that means? Scent. It's also the place we think of where Shiloh comes. <laughs> The water that you water your plants with, the water that you want, water the seed that's in you. See, I don't know exactly what Kara wants to be, but I know that what God has put in her, if she takes care of it, it will come to pass. What he begins in us, he brings to completion. And also, he's put her into a family. That family has a call on their life. I'm kind of, I like that family. I like all your families. But you and I must go back. What has God said to us in the word? And I'm very much, if, if you have heard a word from someone else that spoke to you, and you knew in your heart that was from God, hang on to that word. You see, what brought Moses into the land when the Egyptians were just destroying the Israelites with bondage? They cried out to the Lord, and the Lord says, I remembered the covenant I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you remember the covenant that God made with you and your family, cry out to God the words of that covenant, that's living water. What you can't do is what I've done at times as I look at all the problems. You know, when we just went to the state fair, there was a lot happening. Johnny got sick just at the moment that everything was happening with cropping. And then Ina got sick and passed away. And I remember thinking, how can we even be here? What, what can we do? I, there's just this, and I thought, and I'm sure, I have a hunch that there are things about Johnny and I that are totally different, but I know something that's the same, that we'll die trying to get the job done. And you know what? The job's not that important. And I think the Lord spoke that. I could, I could just, I can imagine Johnny's so sick he can't see straight, and he's thinking about, the corn's not getting. In fact, the chopper broke how many times? Three. I mean, and I was thinking all this, and I thought, you know what? Those are realities, but that's not living water. And so you deal with it, but you get up and say, I know the plans you have for me. Plans to prosper me. Plans for hope and a future. You know, I mentioned that I was listening to that Sing to the Lord tape. And Colleen came on singing the song that Lois had written out of 145. Glory and peace shall reign with them. They shall overflow with love one for another and shall love their God. That's living water. 
put that on the wall say it every day because God's Word listen to what Lois just read to us it's ridiculous this man's hands were going black his feet were going black that means he's dead that means he's no longer metabolizing oxygen it means how many of you know when something dies it's over I, I you know I've seen a lot of things dead and they stay dead because the minute they die life is gone you and I may not be able to find life but we can tell when it's gone and yet that man heard the Word of God go back and pray for that man he says I can't and I'm just thinking oh Lord don't ever ask me to do something like that <laughs> isn't it ridiculous that we're more worried about looking bad than raising somebody from the dead but the house of Levi and Aaron the house of Israel God's people we live in a in a difficult time but it's a time of great opportunity but the thing Sukkot is made possible the final harvest is made possible by watering the seed with the word and with the Holy Spirit and bringing it to harvest there's so much that God has planted in you individually and in us corporately but one of the things that I feel just impassioned to tell you hang on to the words that God has given you even in the face when it looks like nothing could ever make it happen because he is a resurrecting God that's one of the things he does he takes dead things and makes them alive he takes ruins things and fixes them he redeems things that's his nature Romans 1 you're without excuse because God's very nature is in the things he has made go up to the mountain and look at the mountain after the winter and the leaves are off the trees not the pine trees of course the grass is all dead the water starts to flow over the surface the Sun shines it warms up and what happens life comes back I've told you a million times about going to Yellowstone the year it all burned it was the worst thing I'd ever seen you couldn't see anything it was all smoke Joy and I went 20 years later there were trees 10 and 15 feet tall the things the places that were burned off were alive and vibrant they were coming how come because it's his nature he's a reviving God after two days he'll revive them on the third day he'll resurrect them and so I've shortened this down you should be happy about that but the real essence of the message is Sukkot this time of entering into our inheritance I would like you to think of that shofar blowing and it's telling you go back to who you were if I or anyone else has tried to make you feel uncomfortable for who you are God loves you the way he made you he's the author he's the creator don't listen to those things that say don't be who you are you need to be redeemed I need to be redeemed but have you ever noticed in the world we want to make everybody in our image but we're made in his image and Sukkot is about coming into our inheritance the final harvest is when all of us are comfortable and secure in our identity you know Greg was poking fun a little bit at John and me and John Paul and that's not really fun but it's true that when you when you catch people on a subject they like what happens they are excited that they're, they're you know that's that's normal that's how you were made there should be things that light your fire if there isn't you're dead. <laughs> yeah you're on the dead and we have a resurrecting God and Sukkot when, when you think about Sukkot the final harvest the final harvest happens when we're ripe and when you're ripe guess what then you can tell who you are have you ever noticed that when plants are growing up sometimes it's hard to tell what they are especially if you're not a farmer I know sometimes I'll, I enjoy driving by fields when they're oats wheat and barley and trying to figure out what they are and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's but once there's a once there's a seed in the head you know this is a day it's a blessed day I know when I was growing up a lot of people were concerned and they told me I'm not sure you should go to school because the Lord might return you know what I'm gonna tell you 
the Lord is going to return. Go to school. He'll find you. <laughs> You're not lost. Get married, raise a family, start a business. This is a time of hope. This is a time of growth. It's a time of celebration of the harvest, of accepting the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, the king in Israel. And it's a wonderful time. As we close here tonight, one of the things we can ask the Lord, how can we help others come into their own identity? How can we assist? How can we water the seed that God put in them? Be encouragers. Be those who strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Because that's the day we're in. Yeshua said on the last day of the feast, you all know this, John 7, 37. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. This Spirit has been given. Each one of us are a fountain. I'm not sure that was good grammar. Each one of us is. Who knows? We are a fountain of living water. And you know, sometimes your living water is what has kept my plant growing. When it, sometimes it's stressed by the sun, when it seems to be cut off by a storm. The wonderful thing about the Feast of Sukkot is we have, we've seen the fulfillment of Passover. The children of Israel leaving the land of Egypt, going through the Red Sea. We've seen Shavuot with the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Holy Spirit. But Sukkot, we've seen the building of the temples, the return from uh, Babylon. But the real picture that's in Zechariah and other places, it's in our future. So this is an exciting moment. We're looking to see the final harvest, to see us back home. And so I'm going to read to you Ephesians 1. Paul prayed this for the Ephesians, but I'll bet you he prayed it for you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Did you get that? That the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. So your heart can see. How many of you know you've got to see something with your heart? If you only see it with your eyes, it's not going to change you. It's not going to move you. Paul's praying that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so you'll know what the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his strength of his might, which he brought about on the Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This is a pep talk, and it is one on purpose. And usually when I give pep talks, the number one audience is me. But I've sensed this really strongly lately with the Lord. I said, Lord, because I don't know about you, I sometimes have seen some of the trends in the house of Aaron, and I find them disturbing. It, it seems in some ways like we're shrinking. I, I see a lot of things. And then I realized as I prayed, the Lord said, if you keep rehearsing what you see as the problems, you're going to fulfill where your vision is taking you. He says, if you want to see what I have for you, stop saying those things. Stop praying those things. Stop thinking those things. Speak my thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I said, yes, Lord. We do have a glorious inheritance. It's a wonderful time and Another verse that came to me is, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And so I've been asking the Lord when I go to say things, when I go to think things, is this acceptable to you? Does this bless you? Does this? And several times he said, no. <laughs> I got a little sick this week, 
And I don't know about you, one of the hardest times I have being positive is when I feel crappy. And it shows me how tied I am to my flesh. But my flesh isn't going to do this job anyway. God uses it, I'm grateful. I'm quite happy with this flesh. It's worked for 70 years, pretty much. We are going to get together in the tent again right now to seal our evening with, it's a mitzvah to eat in the tent. I don't know if you can eat anymore. We had such a good supper. But remember, the water that God has poured out at Sukkot is his Holy Spirit. It's bringing forth the crop, and it's living water. So whatever God has told you about yourself, I mentioned to you several times, it was amazing to me, I went back and looked at the words that were said about the dairy, and 40 years later, they start coming to pass. They just start happening. And you know, I'd like to say, boy, I'm sure good. No. God is good. And we have wonderful people who work down there and help us out. But this is true in the house of Aaron. What God has said to you, he will bring it to pass. And that's Sukkot. That is the harvest coming in and the shofar blowing and you and I returning to our inheritance. So if anybody's made you feel uncomfortable for who you are, forgive them and go on. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. Yes, Mary. I will be short. I just want to acknowledge what a good, good father we have. And I just want to say thank you for all of you. I know when you go through hard things, everybody's saying, can I do something? Can I do something? I feel so helpless. But I just want you all to know how much we just felt all the love, all the support, all of the prayers. I mean, the texts, the cards, everything was just such a blessing, and, and we felt it. And I want to share this because I think it's interesting, and it goes along with prayer. We had gathered here together to pray, and I don't remember what we were praying about. And this is more than 10 years ago. Um, but I think John had asked, well, is anybody hearing anything? And I go, yeah. I go, I keep hearing, play it in the key of P. And he gave me this really strange look because he goes, Mary, you do realize that there's no key of P, right? <laughs> I mean, and I'm not the musician in the house. <laughs> but I kept hearing, play it in the key of P. And so, you know, that has stayed with me for all of these years. And when, when we were in the emergency room with Johnny and all of you, gathered here and you were praying for us and Jessica sent me a little snapchat and I played that to Johnny and as I was playing that to Johnny I mean the Lord just said Mary they're playing it in the key of P and I don't know how this works I can't necessarily explain it but it's like the Lord allowed me to hear in the he heavenly realm each of your prayers and each of your prayers has its own sound its own frequency and its own resonance and the Lord just said that's such a pleasing offering to me when my people gather together and pray for one another and I just felt like he was just saying you know this is such an acceptable offering and we feel so blessed. And I know that it was an answer to prayer. And I mean, I was talking with Dean the other day. I go, you know, here again, we had talked with Andre Crouch on Saturday. And after we had spent about 25 minutes, he says, he goes, you need to get Johnny in to the hospital. And so we had taken him in. And then they sent us home. And I go, oh, thank you, Lord. And I go, you know what? I go, if I would have taken him in on Sunday, they would have been transporting him up north. I mean, he kept declining after that. And I know that they would have sent us up north if I would have taken him in on Sunday. So the fact that we went in on Saturday, they evaluated him at that point. He didn't fit the criteria and how tight hospital beds are. They, they sent us home. And, I, and that's where he needed to be. He needed to be at home. I mean, Greg and Lois, they walked around our house. And they were praying for us, and we knew it. And we could feel it. So I just, 
I know that it's a helpless feeling when people are going through it, but I mean, it meant so much that you guys were praying, and we knew it. We knew it. And we didn't doubt for a minute, and we don't doubt for a minute how much everybody loves us and is there, and that we could ask anybody for anything, and you would do it. So I want to acknowledge the Lord, and I just want to express our thank and our love in return to all of you. You can't go through something like this without having people you love around you. You just can't. So thank you. Thank you. So play it in the key of P. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to close Sure. So, Father, we are so grateful. We're so grateful for this group of people and the opportunity that we have to gather in your name and as your family, Lord, that we have one Father, we have one King, and that we are united as one people, Lord. We are so grateful for the opportunity that we have. We just ask, Lord, that you would just bless each one, that you would meet each one right where they are. And as we go through this weekend, that you would just speak so tenderly to each one, just exactly what it is that they need to hear, Father, that they, each one of us here has a cry of our heart and that you are the only one that knows that and you're the only one that can speak specifically to that. So, Father, I just ask that you would just touch each one in a very personal way that they know that even though you are the infinite God, that you know exactly where they are and what is happening and what is going on in their life. So, Father, we do want to just praise you and acknowledge you that you are a good, good Father, that you are gathering your people, that there is a revival that is coming in our land, that there's a water and a washing that's coming that will be like nothing that we have seen in our lifetime and that each one of us that are here now have been born for this appointed time, Father, so may we be faithful in stewarding the call that you have placed on all of our lives. And we say it now in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Those who would like, go to the tent. 8 o'clock.